friends in this video we are going to discuss the pediatrics questions that came in the recent fmg june 2022 exam so there were almost 20 questions from pediatrics so again reiterating the fact that it is a basic yet a very very important subject most of the questions were pretty straightforward barring one or two questions and they have been covered thoroughly in our videos and notes okay so as you can appreciate these are recalled questions so there may be you know some change in the language of questions or the options because these have been accumulated based on the recall provided by you students but remember uh, not fretting upon what the exact question or options was these topics nevertheless are very very important for all your upcoming exams okay so here we begin the first question when does handedness get established so handedness means whether the child is a right handed person or a left handed person so this handedness begins to appear okay we've already discussed in our videos that it begins to appear by 2 years of age that means 24 months okay and gets established by 3 years of age that is 36 months okay gets established by 3 years of age so you can appreciate out of the given options that is 6 to 12 months, 15 to 18 months, 18 to 24 months. As the question is asking when does the handedness get established, our best answer will be 36 to 40 months which is closest to the 3 years. Okay. Moving to the next question, this was a question on neonatal resuscitation. Again a very basic one, a baby was born limp and having apnea. Apnea means the baby is not breathing. Okay. What will you do next? So during neonatal resuscitation for this baby, are you going to start CPR or you're going to give oxygen or umbilical vein catheterization or bag and mask ventilation? Okay, so I'm sure you would have answered it correctly. So what happens in the latest neonatal resuscitation algorithm? We begin by checking antenatal counseling, team briefing and equipment check. Okay, so we do all these antenatal counseling, team briefing, equipment check and then the baby is born. We look at whether the, it was term gestation, good muscle tone, breathing or crying. If yes then routine care is provided. But if no, then we provide warmth, position, clear airway if required, dry and stimulate. Okay. And then we assess. So here comes this question. So if the baby's heart rate is less than 100 per minute or the baby is having apnea, that means not breathing or gasping <sighs> like this. Okay. Then what do you do? You have to start positive pressure ventilation and positive pressure ventilation during neonatal resuscitation friends we know is provided using self-inflating bag and a mask. So basically in other words you start bag and mask ventilation, check the saturation of the baby and consider using a cardiac or ECG monitor. Okay. Now if despite that the baby does not improve you have to take ventilation corrective steps and then even if the, the baby continues to have you know heart rate less than 60 then we move on to chest compression subsequently followed by injection adrenaline in a stepwise manner okay so moving back to our question so the baby was born limp and was having apnea so what will you do next so of course we are going to start bag and mask ventilation for this baby and we all know that there is one absolute contraindication for bag and mask ventilation that is congenital diaphragmatic hernia which is also asked many a times moving to the next question a child's height for age, okay, height for age is less than minus 2 ST or Z score. This child will be classified under which of the following categories? Whether it is wasting or normal or stunting or SAM, severe acute malnutrition. So we know that wasting basically refers to decrease in weight for height. So if the weight for height is less than minus 2 standard deviations, we call it wasting. Stunting is height for age less than minus 2 standard deviations or Z score. So these are as per the WHO classification for malnutrition. Okay. And severe acute malnutrition we know if there is severe wasting. Severe wasting that means the weight for height. Okay. Is less than minus 3 Z score or standard deviations. Or if the mid arm circumference is less than 11.5 centimeters. Or if the child has bilateral pedal edema of nutritional origin bilateral pedal edema of nutritional origin. So in a child between 6 months to 5 years age, we call that child having severe acute malnutrition of if any of these criteria are present. So clearly in the given question, the child's height for age is less than minus 2 standard deviation. So the child has stunting. Okay, very easy. And we have covered it in our videos and notes. Now a 4 year old child's weight falls between 85th to 95th percentile on growth chart. The child comes under which category? So, you know, if the weight for age or if the BMI. So, for older children, we are going to take the BMI. 
for younger children we are going to take the weight for height or weight for age okay now this bmi we all know the formula it is weight in kgs by the square of height in meters right now bmi if it is less than 5th percentile then the child is called underweight or undernourished okay so ideally bmi should have been mentioned in the question so usually you know this overweight and obese to classify that we use body mass index okay but if it is not mentioned we can use weight of the child as well if it is between 85th to 95th percentile we call the child as having overweight okay and if it is more than 95th percentile the child is classified as having obesity okay obesity right so in this given question this 4 year old child's weight falls between 85th to 95th percentile on growth chart so this child will be classified as having overweight okay moving on to the next question again a question on malnutrition so what we have here is a 3 year old child who presented to opd with his mother his mother reports normal breastfeeding till 2 years of age now the child has decreased milk intake on examination malnutrition features were there along with edema what is the diagnosis so we know if a child is having you know poor feeding apathy lethargy malnutrition along with edema then your diagnosis is squash yorker in marasmus edema is not present and wasting and sending we already saw the definitions which are very specific wasting is weight for less than minus 2 standard deviations so let's go and sending is height for age less than minus 2 standard deviations so squash yorker is the best answer for this question out of the given options nutrient deficient in breast milk is vitamin a b c d so out of these you know vitamin d is deficient in breast milk and that is why it is recommended that for all babies during infancy that is during first year of life we need to supplement 400 international units of vitamin d every day okay now remember both vitamin d and vitamin k are deficient in breast milk so if both are present as options then you can either choose the option which has both vitamin d and vitamin k or you know you can choose vitamin d over vitamin k now because breast milk is deficient in vitamin k also so 1 mg intramuscular dose of vitamin k is to be given to all babies at birth to prevent hemorrhagic disease of newborn or vitamin k deficiency bleeding however cow's milk if you look at is deficient in vitamin c and cow milk uh, fed babies have more chances of having scurvy okay pearly white lesions okay pearly white lesions with foamy appearance are seen on sclera of a child Which of the following other symptoms are related to the deficiency of the same micronutrient causing the mentioned lesion? So this question again a pretty straightforward question, but it requires some analysis on your part. So what is mentioned is pearly white lesions with foamy appearance on the sclera of the child. So if you know this is the eye, so these pearly white lesions can be something like this. So which are you know bite out spots. So conjunctival cirrhosis moving on to bite out spot can give rise to this pearly white foamy appearance. and that friends we know classically is a sign of vitamin a deficiency so which of the other features are seen in vitamin a deficiency conjunctival cirrhosis yes in fact conjunctival cirrhosis is the earliest sign of vitamin a deficiency while night blindness is the earliest symptom of vitamin a deficiency okay angular stomatitis and glossitis no they are seen in riboflavin deficiency photosensitive rash no again in niacin deficiency okay which vitamin deficiency gives rise to the lesions shown in the given image so though you know the image shows an adult person but you know we dealt with the micronutrients and nutrition is very very important from pediatrics perspective so we are discussing the questions of nutrition and in one areas of metabolism which might have you know some overlap with medicine as well or biochemistry so you can see the uh, casal necklace kind of rash here so the rash is there you know the rash is there in the sun exposed areas okay it is there on the hands it is there on the neck okay so that rash is basically due to niacin deficiency which gives rise to pellagra so pellagra is a disease of some d's where there is diarrhea dermatitis dementia and even death can happen okay riboflavin deficiency will cause angular stomatitis cheilitis and so on thiamine deficiency will give rise to beriberi perhaps a question on beriberi and adult person was also there in the questions this type folic acid deficiency again will lead to megaloblastic anemia not a picture like this moving on to the ninth question So this was a new question this time a child presented with severe vomiting and dehydration a b c d e was performed what does d stand for so you know if a child or an adult presents with a medical emergency 
first thing, whatever be the medical emergency, be it severe dehydration, be it some shock, be it some poisoning. Okay, so if there is a medical emergency, you do A, B, C, D, E first. Okay, so what is this A, B, C, D, E? A means airway. You check whether the airway is patent or not. Otherwise, secure the airway if required. Intubation may also be done. Breathing, you see whether the breathing of the child is adequate to support him or her or not. Circulation, you look at whether there are features of circulation failure or shock, pulses are well palpable or not, start IV fluid or boluses accordingly. D is basically for disability. That means you check the mental status of the child, whether any altered sensorium is there or not. You can use the GCS, that is the Glasgow Coma Scale or Glasgow Coma Score also. Or you can use the AVPU classification. That means alert, the child is alert or not, responding to voice or not, responding to pain or not, or unresponsive or not. Okay. So disability, again, you have to look at. And E for exposure, you have to expose the child adequately to look for any signs of trauma or, you know, bleeding manifestations or any other clues that might give, uh, you know, some hint about the underlying pathology in that child. Okay. So even though this child has vomiting and severe dehydration, here A, B, C, D, E. So D will stand for disability and not dehydration, dementia or diarrhea. Okay, moving on to the next question. The first dose of measles vaccine was given at 7 months due to some reason. So, we know normally measles vaccine is recommended beyond, you know, at 9 completed months of age. Because prior to that, there are some maternal antibodies which might interfere with the immune response to measles. So, if due to any reason, say an epidemic or something, the measles vaccine was given at 7 months of age, it is not counted as such as a part of immunization schedule. So you still need to give a dose at 9 months and a booster at 16 to 24 months. So next dose at 16 to 24 months is not the right answer. You need to give a dose at 9 months as well. So first dose at 9 months and next at 16 to 24 months is the best answer. No dose at 9 months, booster at 9 months. No, they are not correct. Okay, which vaccines are given at birth? We all know the vaccines given at birth are BCG, OPV birth dose and the hepatitis B birth dose. Okay, MR or DPT or IPV are not recommended at birth, right? In the national immunization schedule of India. Which of the following vaccines is recommended at birth? So this time a lot of these pretty straightforward questions were there from immunization. So we know measles or MR vaccine is not given at birth. Japanese encephalitis, no. BCG, yes. Vitamin A, no. So, PCG is recommended at birth, okay? Another question, hepatitis B vaccine should be given at? So, we know hepatitis B vaccine as a part of national immunization schedule, we give it at birth because if the mother's hepatitis B status is unknown or mother's hepatitis B positive, this birth dose of hepatitis B vaccine is going to go a long way in protecting the baby against hepatitis B, okay? So, three at three months or six months or one year is not there as a part of the national immunization schedule. So, at birth, we give hepatitis B and then at 6, 10 and 14 weeks, we give it as a part of the pentavalent vaccine, okay, in the national immunization schedule of India. Now, moving ahead to the next question, what we have here is a two-year-old child who presented to the primary health center with complaint of difficulty in breathing. On physical examination, chest in drawing was present and respiratory rate of 38 per minute. What is the next best step? So, first, we need to classify this child and then we'll think about management. So, first we need to see whether fast breathing is there or not and chest in drawing is there or not. So, what do you mean by fast breathing? So, we need to know the definition of fast breathing. In a child less than 2 months age, we call it fast breathing if the respiratory rate is greater than 60 per minute. 2 to 12 months of age, we call it fast breathing if the respiratory rate is more than 50 per minute. Okay, and 1 to 5 years, we call it fast breathing if the respiratory rate is more than 40 per minute. Now, in the given question, how much was the respiratory rate? So, it was 38. Okay. So, it is not fast breathing. But remember, chest in drawing is present here. Okay. In the question, it is mentioned that the child does have chest in drawing. So, if irrespective of whether fast breathing is present or not, if there is chest in drawing present, then the child will be classified as having pneumonia. And if any of the general danger signs are present, like if the child is not feeding or having convulsions, okay, or, you know, is, is lethargic and dull or unconscious. So, if any of the general danger signs are present, then this becomes severe pneumonia or very severe disease. Okay. Severe pneumonia or very severe disease. Now, in the given case scenario, no general danger sign is mentioned. So, our diagnosis in the given case scenario is pneumonia. Right. So, this is not severe pneumonia. So, we do not need to start IV antibiotics and refer the child. There is nothing called moderate pneumonia, so we are not marking this. 
pneumonia give oral antibiotics and follow up after 2 days at psc is the best answer out of the given options and it is not no pneumonia no pneumonia means when there is no fast breathing no chest pain going okay if there is severe pneumonia or very severe disease we need to start iv antibiotics and refer the child okay moving on to the next question a child with difficulty in breathing had steeple sign on x ray now we all know steeple sign on x ray so steeple sign on x ray means the airways become narrow like this okay and that is suggestive of croup or acute laryngotracheal bronchitis now the treatment of choice for croup we know is apart from oxygen and respiratory support you need to give steroids single dose oral or in intramuscular steroids dexamethasone is usually preferred so single dose steroids and in moderate to severe cases nebulized epinephrine may be given now because croup is a viral illness there is no role of antibiotics we have discussed this very well in our videos okay on respiratory system so antibiotic with steroid and oxygen we need not give antibiotic here because it is a case of croup which is a viral condition oral steroid yes that seems to be a plausible option again antibiotic cuff suppressant with decongestant no reassure the patient no okay so uh, oral steroid is the best answer of the given options which is the most common seizure found in the age group of less than 2 years so febrile seizures we know is the most common seizure in children less than 5 years also in children less than 2 years also so any child between 6 months to 5 years of age is having seizures along with significant fever without any evidence of cns infection we call it febrile seizures which can be simple or complex febrile seizures so tonic clonic seizures are not the most common type petit mal or absence seizures again no myoclonic seizures no okay a child presents with lish nodules so lish nodules on iris and caffeolase spots so both these are suggestive of neurofibromatosis a neurocutaneous condition neurofibromatosis where you can also get axillary freckling similar history in the relatives you can get neurofibromas or some cns tumors can also be there okay similar symptoms are seen in his father and grandmother so you can see it looks like a autosomal dominant condition because the parents of the child and the parents of the parents that is the grandparent is also having this these problems so what is the mode of transmission of this condition okay so mode of transmission of this condition is autosomal dominant we all know for neurofibromatosis okay which of the following is true regarding the inheritance of neural tube defects so neural tube defects we know do not follow any particular inheritance pattern because they have a multifactorial inheritance okay so they have a multifactorial inheritance and folic acid is given during pregnancy or started before conception helps in preventing neural tube defects okay so it does not have any of those mendelian patterns of inheritance it is multifactorial a baby was born in with neural tube defect some people said it was anencephaly the condition what should have been done to prevent this condition so as we mentioned if the folic acid has been started in the mother before conception okay at least one month before conception and continued through the pregnancy it helps in preventing the neural tube defects what is very very important again is the dose of folic acid so it should be 400 microgram at least 400 microgram per day it is actually recommended in all girls of child bearing age and in those mothers who are high risk that means who have had a previous baby with neural tube defects or who are on some anti epileptics for them the dose recommended is 4000 microgram per day or 4 mg per day okay so iron no thiamine no riboflavin no this will not help in preventing neural tube defects a child is brought to opd with complaints of change in color of urine after some time so there was a mixed school of opinion some uh, students mentioned that this was probably an adult who come presented with complaint of change in color of urine on standing okay mother gives a history that she noticed a dark black color on diapers when her baby was few months old so anyways uh, whether it is an adult whether it is a child inborn error of metabolism we've already discussed okay so this uh, person is uh, suffering from a disease called alkaptonuria where the urine turns black on standing and in adulthood you can get ochronosis that means pigmentation on the sclera of the eye on the ear cartilage and some cardiac valve involvement arthritis and all can also be there in children the only complaint will be that the urine turns black on standing okay so alkaptonuria is a disease we know where there is deficiency of the enzyme homogenesic acid oxidase and we've discussed it already phenylalanine hydroxylase is deficient in a disease called phenylketonuria tyrosine amino transferase and 4 hydroxy phenyl pyruvate dioxygenase are deficient in tyrosinemia so the best answer to this question is homogenesic acid oxidase okay so friends these were the 20 questions that i could get recalled from you students from pediatrics i'm sure there'll be many more so i hope you have answered these questions correctly and go through these important topics they will remain up important for your upcoming exams as well all the best okay keep working hard and you'll surely get whatever you want thank you